All right, everybody, this is going to be on the wall. I think it's part four, but all right. Uh, Rob Lee did a thing on um, stay in the yard. Well, I think this fits right into that. All right, let's go to Job chapter one. And I've covered this a little bit before, but it ties into this. So, uh, Job 1.1. 1, 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright, one that feared God and eschewed or hated evil. And there was born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses in a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men in the east. Can you imagine trying to feed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen? I mean, you know, you must have a pretty big bunch of people, right? Verse 4. And his sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and drink with them, and it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. I have a feeling that Job's daughters were more righteous than his sons. But that's just me. Verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord uh, said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God, and escheweth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth God, Does Job fear God for naught? And does, you know, does Job fear you for nothing? Verse 10. Hast not thou made an hedge about him? Now what's a hedge? It's like a fence, people, a wall. Hast not thou made an hedge about him, and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. So here it is, Job's making, I mean, uh, Satan's making a bet with God. Oh yeah? You let me touch him. You let me, you let me have Job for a while. He'll, he'll curse you, God. Verse 12. And the Lord said unto Satan, I'll take your bet. No, that's, that's the Bob translation. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself. Put not forth thine hand. In other words, you can touch anything he's got, but you can't kill him. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And then a bunch of bad stuff happens to him. But the point is, God put a hedge around Job. Satan was not allowed to touch him. And we need to be perfect and upright and hate evil just like Job did. Because God will put a hedge of protection about us just like he did for them, a wall. Now, where does it mention a, a, who, a, a hedge? Well, in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 10, Verse 6, folly is set in great dignity, and the rich sit in low place. I have seen servants upon horses, and princes walking as servants upon the earth. He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaketh an hedge, a serpent shall bite him. So if God puts a hedge around you and you break through that hedge, 
You jump over that wall, you leave the yard, a serpent shall bite him. And who's the serpent? Uh, take a guess. All right, um, Revelation 12 and verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. That's us. He might not deceive us on everything, but he probably has us all deceived on some things. Which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So, all right, let's take a look at the wall. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 25. Now, you got to realize something. King David, future King David, this is David uh, sometime after he had slewn Goliath. And uh, King Saul, who was king before David, became jealous of David and tried to kill him. Now, here it is. King Saul was... Uh, fearful to go fight Goliath the giant. And David did it. And instead of Saul being grateful, he tried to kill David. Because he knew that Saul, well, Saul was getting involved in all kinds, he had been disobedient and getting involved in stuff he shouldn't have. He broke the hedge that God put around him. So David... Uh, Saul tried to kill David, so David had to run for his life. And there were people that uh, recognized David as the future king. Uh, in some ways, I think David, king da uh, future King David was like uh, Robin Hood and his band of merry men. You know, he had a bunch of outcasts and other people that had didn't have anything and they they figured they would hang out with you know hang out with David now you better believe David had trained these people okay so here it is David's hiding from Saul and obviously you're not going to hide from the king in a city you're going to be out in the country somewhere all right so now Samuel was the prophet. All right, 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 1. And Samuel died, and all the Israelites were gathered together and lamented him and buried him in the house at Ramah. And David arose and went down into the, to the wilderness of Paran. And there was a man in Maon whose possessions were in Carmel, and the man was very great. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now, the name of the man was Nabal. Now, what's interesting is a lot of the um, names in the Old Testament have meanings. Nabal actually means fool. Fool. F-O-O-L. Fool. As in the fool is said in his heart, there is no God. All right, so with that in mind, now the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife was Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. But the man was churlish and evil in his doings, and he was of the house of Caleb. Remember the you know, Joshua and Caleb were the, uh, I think they were the only two ones that, spied out the land for uh, Moses. Oh, I'm sorry. No, Joshua. Yeah, Joshua and Caleb. Uh, they were the only, you know, Caleb was a man of faith. So uh, he was evidently a probably a great, 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 great grandson of Caleb. Verse 4, And David heard in the wilderness that Nabal did shear his sheep. And David sent out ten young men, and David said unto the young men, Get you up to Carmel and go to Nabal and greet him in my name. Now remember something. David had saved 
Israel from the Philistines, the, the giants, because he had killed Goliath and the Philistines fled and the army of the Israelites were greatly, had great morale and they, they attacked them and defeated them. Other than that, uh, the Philistines would have, you know, killed everybody and, and stole all their property and land and, and their possessions and their sheep and animals. David saved them from that. And, you know, what would this guy have had if, if not for David? You know, the Philistines would have taken everything and probably killed him. And David heard in the wilderness that Nabal did shear his sheep. And David sent out ten young men, and David said unto the young men, Get you up to Carmel, and go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. And thus shall ye say to him that liveth in prosperity. This guy's got a lot of stuff. So he's saying, okay, go out there and, and say to him, Peace be both to thee, and peace be to thine house, and peace be unto all that thou hast. And now I have heard that thou hast shears. Now thy shepherds which were with us, we hurt them not. Neither, neither was there aught missing unto them all the while they were in Carmel. Okay. In other words, we have a small army here. We didn't hurt your people. We didn't steal anything from you. And not only that, we protected you from bandits, your people from bandits. And let me tell you something, people. You got a bunch of armed men running around, uh, the shepherds and stuff. You're not going to want, if you're a robber, you're not going to want to try to mess with those people. You're going to go somewhere else where there's just shepherds and no no armed men running around because you don't know if they're who these armed men are, you know? Verse 8. So these people say, Ask thy young men, and they will show thee. Wherefore, let the young men find favor in thine eyes. For we come in a good day. Give, I pray thee, whatsoever cometh to thine hand unto thy servants and to thy son David. So, David's saying to Nabal, Hey, we've been protecting your, your flocks. And I, you know, we protected Israel, your flocks. Why don't you... Give us a little something so that we can survive here, you know? Verse 9, And when David's young men came, they spake to Nabal according to all those words in the name of David and ceased. And Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my, for my shears and give it unto men whom I know not whence they be? Wow, how's that for gratitude, huh? Here it is. David saved Israel from, you know, Goliath. And he's been protecting these people. He's been protecting Nabal's people and his flocks. And he says, oh, shall I take my bread, my water, and my meat and give it to these people? Who the heck is David? Who does he think he is? Verse 12. So David's young men turned their way and went again and came and told him all those sayings. Now, what is David thinking? Oh, and David said unto his men, gird ye on every man his sword. And they girded on every man his sword, and David also girded on his sword. And, and there went up after David about 400 men and 200 abode by the stuff. So do you know what 200 men is? Uh, for those of you that are in the military, that's about two companies of men. Two companies of men. Uh, I don't think Nabal's going to be able to stop an army of, you know, two, 400 men. Verse 14, but one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master, and he railed on them. In other words, he insulted David, Nabal, the fool. 
So here this, this young man, one of Nabal's servants, went and told Abigail, Nabal's wife, and said, David, David saluted our master, but our master, he, he insulted them. Verse 15, but the men were very good unto us, and we were not hurt, neither missed we anything, as long as we were conversant with them when we were in the fields. Verse 16, pay attention. They were a wall. David's men, they were a wall unto us, both by day, I'm sorry, both by night and day. All the while we were with them, keeping the sheep. In other words, David's people were a wall of protection to Nabal's shepherds. They were a wall unto us, both by night and day. All the while we were with them, keeping the sheep. Now, therefore, know and consider what thou wilt do for evil. For evil is determined against our master and against all his household, for he is such a son of Belial that a man cannot speak to him. Belial is a name for the devil. He's saying, for he is such a... Nabal, for he is such a son of Belial that a man cannot speak to him. Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves of bread and took 200 loaves and two bottles of wine and five sheep ready dressed and five measures of parched corn and a hundred clusters of raisins and 200 cakes of figs and laid them on asses. And she said unto her servants, go on before me, behold, I come after you. But she told not, but she told not her husband Nabal. And it was so as she rode on the ass that she came down by the covert of the hill. And behold, David and his men come down against her, and she met them. Now David had said, Surely in vain have I kept all that this fellow hath in the wilderness, so that nothing is missed of all that pertaineth un unto him, and he hath requited me evil for good. So and more also do God unto the enemies of David, if I leave of all that pertain to him by the morning light, any that pisseth against the wall. Women, you don't understand that, but um, that's kind of a saying. Uh, when a man goes to the bathroom against the wall, it splashes back against him. Uh, yeah. I mean, this is... David's angry. David is mad. I mean, he's like, all that I've done for Israel and this clown, and, and I ask him for a favor to feed us. And, and he answers me like the devil. I'm going to kill this guy and all, all his whole house, all of them. I'm going to kill them all. Verse 23. And when Abigail saw David, she hasted and lighted off the ass and fell before David on her face and bowed herself to the ground and fell at his feet and said, Upon me, my Lord, upon me, let this iniquity be and let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak in thine audience and hear the words of thine handmaid. Let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Remember, it's fool. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, thine handmaid, saw not the young men of my Lord, whom thou didst send. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, seeing the Lord hath withholden thee from coming to shed blood, and from avenging thyself with thine own hand, now let thine enemies, and they that seek evil to my Lord, be as Nabal." And now this blessing which thine handmaid hath brought unto my Lord, let it even be given unto the young men that follow my Lord. I pray thee, forgive the trespasses, the trespass of thine handmaid, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord fighteth the enemies, I'm sorry, because the Lord fighteth the battles of the Lord. See, David was fighting the battles of the Lord. Because my Lord, she's talking about, David, because my Lord fighteth the battles of the Lord, Father in heaven, 
and evil hath not been found in thee all thy days. Yet a man is risen to pursue thee and to seek thy soul. As she's talking about King Saul is trying to kill David. Yet a man is risen to pursue thee and to seek thy soul, but the soul of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God and the soul of thine enemies. Let them be sling out as out of the middle of a sling. And it shall come to pass when the Lord hath done to my Lord according to all the good that he hath spoken concerning thee and shall have appointed thee ruler over Israel. You see, this woman knows that David's going to be king one day. Verse 31, That this shall be no grief unto thee, nor offense of heart unto my Lord, either that thou hast shed blood causeless, or that my blood hath avenged himself. But when the Lord shall have dealt well with my Lord, then remember thine handmaid. And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which, hath, which sent thee this day to meet me. And blessed be thy advice, and blessed be thou, which hast kept me this day from becoming from coming to shed blood and from avenging myself with mine own hand. For in very deed, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, which hath kept me back from hurting thee, except thou hast hasted and come to meet me, surely there had not been left unto Nabal by the morning light any that pisseth against the wall. Now listen. So David received of her hand that which she had brought him and said unto her, Go in peace in thine house. See, I have hearkened to thy voice and have accepted thy person. So David was going to kill Nabal and all his house. But now he's going to take the gift that Abigail gave him and he's going to take it and go feed his men. Verse 36. And Abigail came to Nabal and behold, he held a feast in his house like the feast of a king, and Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunken. Wherefore she told him nothing, less or more, until the morning light. So she let him party all night as a drunk. And when he woke up the next morning, here's the rest of the story. Verse 37. But it came to pass in the morning when the wine was gone out of Nabal, and his wife had told him these things, that his heart died within him and he became as a stone. He probably had a stroke. You, you gave all my stuff to David and his men, my wife, and you didn't even tell me? And it, verse 38. And it came to pass after 10 days after that the Lord smote Nabal, that he died. Wow. So, let's uh, take a look at something else. All right, uh, before we finish up this story, I want to, uh, let's go to Luke chapter 12. Jesus is speaking. Verse 15, and he, Jesus, and he said unto them, take heed and beware of covetousness. What is covetous is one of those King's English fancy words for being greedy and selfish. Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Your life doesn't consist of how much stuff you gather. Verse 16, And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. This guy has a, a rich man has this farm. Verse 17, And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. In other words, he's got so much stuff, he doesn't even have room to put everything away. Verse 18, and he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. In other words, the barns that he's got are full. He's going to have to tear them down and build a, an extension, an addition. Make it bigger. 
He's got so much stuff, he doesn't have anywhere to put it all. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say unto my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. You ever heard that before? Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And we're talking about M-E-R-R-Y, being happy. We're not talking about a, a gay man with a, a dressing up like a woman named Mary. No. I had to put that in there in case anybody's in San Francisco listening. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool. Nabal, right? Thou fool. But God said unto him, Thou fool. This night thy soul shall be required of thee. God's going to kill him. Thou fool, this night shall, thy, uh, shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? That's a good question. When you die, what good is all that stuff going to be? I've never seen a hearse or a casket with a, with a trailer attached on their way to heaven or hell. Verse 21. So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You see, people, this rich guy, most a lot of people, if, if their storehouses were full, I mean, why not give away stuff to the poor? Somebody tell Benny Hinn and Copeland and all the rest of those TBN 700 Club bunch. Yeah. So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. See, that's what God told that fool Nabal, Abigail's husband. Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? Ha ha, that's a good question. And we're going to be answered when we go back to talk to, you know, Nabal died, right? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. And he just said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, neither for the body, what ye shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Raiment's just clothing, people. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them, how much more are ye better than the fowls? All right, let's go back to 1 Samuel chapter 25. Back to verse 38. And it came to pass after, uh, and it came to pass about 10 days after that the Lord smote Nabal, the rich man, right? That he died. And when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord that hath pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal, and hath kept his servant from evil. For the Lord hath returned the wickedness of Nabal upon his own head. And David sent and communed with Abigail to take her to him to wife. So all of Nabal's stuff passed to Abigail, and Abigail ended up being David's wife. So guess what? David and his merry men, they're not going to be hungry anymore anytime soon, are they? And when the servants of David were come to Abigail to Carmel, they spake unto her, saying, David sent us unto thee to take thee to him to wife. 
And she arose and bowed herself on her face to the earth and said, Behold, let thine handmaid be a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. And Abigail hasted and rose and rode upon an ass with five damsels of hers that went after her. And she went after the messengers of David and became his wife. And David also took Ahinoam of Jezreel, and they were also both of them his wives. But Saul had given Michael, his daughter, David's wife, to Falti, the son of Laish, which was of Galam. Now Saul had given his daughter to David, but guess what? He took his daughter and gave it to somebody else. David paid dearly for that wife. Remember, uh, what was it, a, a bunch of foreskins of the Philistines? Dave, Saul was a really ungrateful, wicked kind of guy. So, all right, this is the end. This is the end of, uh, I think it's part four. So we did, what did we learn? That God puts a hedge about us, and if we break through the hedge or the wall, that uh, a serpent, Satan, will bite us. We learned that David was a wall to Nabal and his people. So, all right, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. In Jesus' name, amen.